think they're on non. Yeah, I'm trying to get to the bottom. What's your topic? Sorry? Oh, your topic? Is it administrative? Yeah, AB, AB deployments, blue green, etc. Yeah, oh, okay. that's right, Dad. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank, oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a good sport to talk about what's up. Somebody, just for this one session. I may have one that's. Uh, I, hold on. I got one uh, after, out of the booth. Hold on. Sorry. After uh, this. Uh, I'll be right back. The mini display. Mini display to VGA, VGA. because on. the HDMI doesn't work for some reason. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. The mini display port. Do you have one? Just mini display port. Does it? Yeah. Put it inside here. Well, you can try here. Then try this one. Is that the same thing I got? Try that one. Oh, there you have one. Oh, you have originals. Okay. Oh, it's, no. it's not original. Slightly original. Yeah. The original won't work with Linux. We have the official Apple one. Really? Yeah, this one does look. <laughs> you can see my screen, right? Good. So we were supposed to start in like five minutes ago, right? Uh, 3.40 was the beginning of the session. Yeah. So we are already five minutes late. Which I'm sorry for. I was actually thinking to use the restrooms before starting, but I didn't have time for that. Uh, so, uh, thanks for coming. Do we have more people coming? Or no? <coughs> Looks if like nobody's on time. Then you can take a, take a quick break if you need to. Yeah, go use the restroom. Yeah, right. Are you okay with that? Sure. You let me? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to lock my screen first. <laughs> Here, we'll do trivia. Yeah, we'll do some trivia. Okay, do a trivia. I'll be right back. And the uh, prize for trivia... They're going to hand out all of your scarves. <laughs> ...is a t-shirt. Okay. T-shirt, like important. this one. <coughs> First okay. question. What is the national animal of Romania? Eagle. What? Eagle. No. No. Dragon. No. Bear. No. Whoa. Lynx. I got a t-shirt. <laughs> You're just making it up. No, I'm not. Go look it up on Wikipedia, Wikipedia and otherwise. Uh, why? How did JavaScript get its name? Why did they name it JavaScript? To make it similar to Java? That's exactly correct. Java had a lot of hype, and they wanted to ride the hype train. What size do you wear? Uh, L? Yep. I put it into piles. Here. No, I like to ch keep my arm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go. Um, what was MongoDB's company name before they changed it to MongoDB? That's a good one. Yeah? Thank you. That's correct. You, but you don't know. gave your shirt to someone else. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take an L. L, okay. Another launch. Coming up. Um, what, when Docker was created as a company, what was their original product? The company that became Docker, what were they formerly before Docker? Not the name, but what was their space they were in? What were they trying to create? Services. I don't know if they were using Grape or... No. <laughs> what, I'm going to give a hint. What was the space that OpenShift is in? Yes, who said that? Okay, what size do you want? They were used to be AppFog. 
Yeah. <coughs> L? So Docker uh, had a PaaS that competed with OpenShift, um, but they created their own container system and their platform sucked, basically. Um, but they had this nice container format, so they decided to um, focus on that. Back to MongoDB. What was their original product as a company? Hint. Mongo's. It's the same answer as before. Raise your hand. Who said it? The same guy. <laughs> no. All right, so MongoDB started out as a platform as a service company as well, and their problem was scaling databases for the clouds, so and they just wrote their own. Uh, let's see. Who did uh, Red Hat, primarily OpenShift, just announce a partnership with to provide OpenShift on their cloud services? Google. Google, Google that's correct. Size? L. Okay. There was two hands, though. Who was that guy? Also, I, I guess I'm at the loop. I thought we were going to see it. All right. Uh, oh, he's going to say Microsoft. What programming <laughs> language is OpenShift 2 written in? Yes, yes. What size? What programming what size? language is OpenShift 3 written in? Oh, 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 oh. uh, too many answers. That was a bad question. And who likes Ruby? Do we have some No. Do I need it? Thank you. All right. Done with trivia. Merrick's back. Thanks for filling the time for me. So my name is Marek. Uh, I'm actually local, so if you are not comfortable asking a question in English, ask in Czech, I'll translate, and we can handle it somehow. I work in the OpenShift team. I work on the evangelist team. So I'm the talking head, so I just travel, explain people. I don't sell. I can sell, it sucks, etc., etc. So I can be honest about things. If you ask me, I will answer honestly. Not only marketing, <coughs> PR, right? Uh, so, my vision for today was to go to the more advanced topics. Uh, have you been to the 8 a.m. Uh, workshop in the morning? The getting started with OpenShift? Who was there? Hands up. Sorry, again. Eight. Who was to the 8 a, uh, 9 a.m. workshop getting started with OpenShift today? Free. Okay, so uh, my idea was to follow up from this workshop to, to some more advanced topics. Uh, so you, it's your choice. Uh, we can either go through the content that was there, which was like basic uh, usage of OpenShift, deploying some application, uh, scaling <coughs> it, exposing routes, which is very basic. Uh, we can do that. Or we can go to the more advanced topics. Uh, my idea was to do something like AB deployments, blue greens, uh, some uh, admin commands that you can run to manage your nodes, manage your pods. Um, what else do I have there? Pre-deploy hooks, uh, something to run when you are deploying applications, etc., etc. So, what do you want to see? Can I make a suggestion? Yes. How many, how many people actually are planning on following along and doing all the exercises? Good question. Okay. <laughs> Only three. Three. We have a problem with Wi-Fi. That's why you're asking, right? Yeah, and because if, if, if they're not, you, how many people want to see the advanced scenarios and how many people want, want to see the basic scenarios? And then you can just run the demo. Yeah, that, that's what I'm asking. Like, what do people would like to see? Advanced. What's your expectations? Advanced. 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 Basic. Advanced. Okay, <laughs> who wants to see the basic? Raise your hand the chance you're going to Who wants to see basic, like the introduction to open shift? Basics. Half? Huh? How many people want to see the advanced? The other half. <laughs> so start with deploying hey, something good. basic. Yeah, the application. Well, actually, I can do it very from basic because for doing a B, we need to deploy something. So we will not go through the materials that we have in the in the in the tutorial, uh, and we will go straight with uh, the deployment. I will speak about different things there, uh, and I will explain also the basic stuff as we go with through the advanced topics. Make sense? Agreed? Or hands up? <laughs> okay, cool. Well done. Uh, I have some, you know, it should not be done, but we have bribes here. So if you answer questions, uh, if you do activity in the, in the session, if you ask questions, which is the most awesome thing. If you ask questions, I love it. So I would love you to ask questions during the, the session. Don't wait to the end. Just raise your hand or shout on me. Yes. You have Debian logo, so does it mean that OpenShift would be uh, deployed on Debian? Uh, I'm quite sure it can be around Debian. Uh, there should be no technical problem. Uh, we use Docker, which yes. is Debian yeah. friendly. 
We use Kubernetes, that's Debian friendly. We use SE Linux. SE Linux is Debian friendly, but Debian is not SE Linux friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a small problem there. Uh, but compared to V2, uh, in V2 we used SE Linux to build the containers itself. So you really need complex policies to secure the applications. That was very complicated to do on Debian because you need to rewrite re re everything for the system. With V2, uh, V3, because we are Docker, the only thing you need to do is to secure record. So it's simple to write the policies, so it should be simple to move to, to Debian, but I am not aware of anyone who would actually go that way. Yeah, it's a matter of resources. I've only on an Ubuntu and Ubuntu directives and internet. It's just a, it's just a, a, a git pull. Yeah. Uh, to, to on Ubuntu, you can actually run, I think right now, if you do, if you take OpenShift and you would try to run it on, uh, on Ubuntu or Debian, it would fail on some parts and different stuff. If you make the siblings and if you make it look like more CentOSy, uh, it would work, but you will not get the security aspects that we have in, uh, in OpenShift. The SCNX policies, if, you, if somebody breaks out of the container, it, he will be able to do anything on the, on the system, right? So it's a matter of what you actually are, expect, uh, you are expecting. Uh, so, and the, the Debian is there. Uh, if you want to download a Vagrant, then you can download it for different, different systems. So it's not, it, it's a mistake to have Debian there. <coughs> it's simple. Uh, okay, so nobody is probably like uh, you should not follow because we have a problem with the Wi-Fi, and the whole session before we have been fixing the the, the Wi-Fi problems. So I will just do it here. You can watch it. I will speak about or, like during the the fix. So I will just move it over here. Uh, and so this is OpenShift. This is the, when you log in, you see the list of the project. And just to make it simple, I will create a new project. I will start with the ABs. That's the basic, it's the simplest one. And I will create a new project for that. What did I do? Okay, over here. So this is my empty project. So who knows what is AB deployment? Okay? Uh, that uh, you have an old version running in the production, you uh, install uh, the new version in production and you route only part of the traffic to the new version. Exactly. So you have two different versions of your application and you put some people on the new one, some people are still seeing the old one, and you slowly move the people from the old <coughs> one to the new one. So you can test if everything's okay, if there's a problem or something like that. Right? So that's A-B deployment. Uh, do, you like, do you want the scar? I already have one. You already have one. Do you want the t-shirt? I already have one. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have... Sticker. <laughs> do you want the sticker? And yeah. we have they, something. They have a workshop. Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> Wait, do they have somebody back home that doesn't have a scarf? <laughs> okay, sorry. You have everything. <laughs> you have been too active in the other sessions. <laughs> I was doing my best. So, uh, to get started, uh, I'm going to deploy an application. So the application is very complex, extremely complex. Like, it, it, there is no, no way you could like, re-implement re the application yourself, right? I put so much effort into it. There is index.php, which co completes, which, co uh, which contains the whole application and it prints H1A. It's the A application. So whenever I hit the application, it will be big A on the screen, nothing else. So make it deploy. I will take the source code of the application from GitHub. I will go to my OpenShift project. I will add to the project. I will choose PHP application. I will name it somehow, so APPA. I will use the Git repo, and I will click Create. Go back over here, so you see that I have a new application. It has some route, so it's accessible from outside, once deployed. There is a service that manages that, that, uh, that application. There is a build running. I can see the logs for that build. So you see that I'm doing something with Docker containers. Uh, I have been using some 
uh, some artifacts over here, somewhere here. Mary, can you bump the fonts a little bit, please? You, you cannot read it? Can, yeah, I can't read it. Okay. Um, now? That's better, okay. thank you. Okay, cool. So we built, we used the source code, we built an image using PHP 5.5 and RHEL 7. So we are using the RHEL Red Enterprise Linux 7 and PHP 5.5 to run a uh, PHP application. And we create a Docker container. So in OpenCV3, everything is based on Docker and Kubernetes. Who knows Docker? Raise your hand. Okay. Who knows Kubernetes? Good. <laughs> so, can you describe me what Docker is about? Containerization. Containerization. So, what's the difference between containers and virtual machines? Uh, one uh, would it depend on the type of virtual machine. Containers runs on the same kernel, which has yes. a scarf, t-shirt. T-shirt. <laughs> can you come and would take it out? Okay. So we'll I'll come awesome. down. You will come? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, that's exactly the, the, good, the, the good answer. Um, because if you have a VM, you, have in every, you are virtualizing the hardware, and you are running an uh, operating system on top of it, the kernel is communicating with the virtual hardware. What, you, what is happening with containers, you are virtualizing the uh, kernel calls, you are virtualizing the kernel for every application. So there's only one kernel, and then there's some user land running in the container only, not the kernel itself. So the benefit is, no, no. Lower overhead. And the con is, the problem with that is? It's isolated from the system. Isolation is one of those problems, but there are technologies like SU that can help you with that. But there is a bigger, well, not bigger, but more obvious problem. Run Linux on it. They don't complain. You have the same kernel and you have the same operating system, so you cannot run two different operating systems on the same node. So you have uh, you cannot run Linux and Windows. You can take Ubuntu container and run it on RHEL 7. That works. Just the, the user land works with the kernel. That usually is not a problem. It's not that, that much recommended, but you can do it. Uh, but you cannot take Windows container and put it on Linux. You cannot take Linux container and put it on Windows. Microsoft is promising to have Docker APIs in uh, Windows Server 2016. Yeah, I've seen it work. Sorry? I've seen it work. Yeah, so it's it's going to be there, so it should work. Yes. The I think Docker for Windows will bring in a Linux kernel using a VM in order to allow you to have that uh, Linux containers. Yeah, and it, it's just a trickle down effect to run on the server. Okay. So it's running on Azure. I've used. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but it, it still, I think, brings in a VM uh, so you can have a Linux kernel and Linux guests. I think they are, right. I'm, I think I'm not nice. sure they would be taking it in nice. a Linux yeah. kernel, but they're definitely using a VM, like they are, because they have a, some virtualization solution, so in uh, 2006, like uh, t Windows 10 Enterprise Edition, you can run every application in a single v light VM to isolate them from each other and see it as a normal window. And I think they're using the same technology to actually run the Docker mm -hmm. containers. But I'm not sure if it with the Linux kernel. But that's that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fun. yeah. <laughs> uh, so we are stopped there. So that's why we are using Docker here because we are using Docker uh, for making the containers for packaging the applications in the platform. So whenever you try to deploy an application, we take the source code, uh, we compile it into Docker container, and then we take the Docker container and run it somewhere in the cluster. So that's the basic workflow. We have a tool called Source to Image. Uh, I think I have it somewhere here as a repo, so you can check it, openshift slash source to image. This is our tool that we designed to, it's open source, you can use it without openshift if you want. It is a tool that takes a Docker image, that is that we call builder image, and it takes the source code and produces new image that is runnable in the app. So it converts the source code into a runnable Docker image. What's the benefit? You don't have to write Docker files. You have the image, one build once, and then you just point at some source code and you get a runnable Docker image at the end. You don't need to always write the, uh, run, git pull, run, compile something, <coughs> run, do something. It will produce you the, the, uh, the resulting image. So that's, that's a nice dependency that we use. Uh, so as well, you can use it without OpenShift. That's mentioned somewhere here. Uh, 
and it's extremely simple. Can you read it? No. Let's go bigger. So you create a Docker image, Docker container that has two mandatory and two optional, so optional scripts. It can be a runnable script, can be Bash, Ruby, whatever. Assemble is used for building the container. So this is run in the build process, and then as an entry point for the new container, it will use the run script. So that's how you spin up the application. In assemble, you have the build process. In run, you have the, the, uh, the startup process. Then you can have safe artifact. Uh, that's useful for Maven. You know Maven? Yeah. You know what happens when you use Maven and you try to build something? Yeah, you wait. You download the whole internet. <laughs> <laughs> and you, if you have to do it every time, it's painful, right? So the safe artifacts allows you to actually cache these artifacts and use it and uh, not to download it every time you run the, uh, run the image. And the usage is, you know, how, how to use this image. Because you can push, uh, push into it some environment variables and those environment variables or some uh, command line switches can change the behavior of the, of, the, of the image. So this is like the help explanation. So extremely simple tool, but extremely powerful because it allows you to do, you to do reproducible builds of your code and you don't need to write the files anymore, which is nice. Okay, so we built a Docker image for our application and at the end we should see that it was pushed into a Docker repository and that means that it, it uh, succeeded and if I go over here, I have one pod running so, most of you said you know Kubernetes. What the hell is that? Uh, you said that you know Kubernetes. What is pod? Collection of containers. Collection of containers. Something else? Is there some some specifics about those containers? It's a hack about Docker to have the same local host network. Uh, could be. Yeah, like, same node. So pod is a set of containers that always run on the same node. They, s they share the same AP address and they have completed the same life cycle. Uh, if you stop the pod, you stop all these containers. If you start the pod, you start all those containers. If you say, I want to redeploy this pod on a different server, you take all those containers in the pod and you move them all onto a different server. It's a logical grouping around some containers that have the same life cycle. So we have a pod with our application. When I open it on a on the web page, I get A. I yes? Uh, in this uh, operative box, it's like only go binary inside another container. So... No, the pod is, is absolutely logical, virtual thing. It like doesn't... We are running OpenShift, and if I deploy an application, I can see two Docker image. One is ma has name like the application, and another one is named like pod, and it's like another container with some time, something is it. So, mm. so when, you, when I run an application, if you get Docker, Docker list or, or Docker. Oh, okay. Docker so PS, you can see the two images. One if you're running OpenShift. Yes. So that probably the, the other one would be the the spin up container. Well, I, I call it spin up container. Uh -huh. It's a manager for other containers. So uh -huh. when you run the builds. For example, there is one container that's privileged, and it push, pulls down a contain, the, the builder container, and then pushes that container back to the. It's like a manager for the for the other containers you need to manage. Yes, but do, but during the running the pod, I can see two containers that are one pod. The one always. Pod. Always. Yeah, there is one. The it's used just to start the containers. It's it depends on, on on what what containers you put into the pod. There could be no. one container or more containers. No, 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 no. Uh, Kubernetes will always start a POS container in a pod. And it's used to, well, you can override it and you can have a container which starts the first in the pod and prepare it. And this is usually not used, so they start a simple container which does nothing. Uh-huh. Okay. It just sits there and does nothing. Okay. Really? Uh, okay, yeah. whatever. <laughs> So there is that two containers in the pod, at least, you say. Yeah. Okay, I'm okay with that if, if you know. Uh, I really don't know that Kubernetes would do it twice, but it's possible. Uh, but I don't have, I have my, my system running with a cluster and there are already containers running. So it would be more difficult to do Docker PS or something like that on the node. 
so to actually actually inspect it. But I will expect I will, I will investigate it because it's pretty interesting. Uh, though it's not that more important for our use case, right? Or is it? No. Okay. So we have the application running, and just to make so I have application A, and to take this application, uh, I need to somehow expose it uh, to the outside world. That's what I have the route for. But to make it, so can I draw on the screen? We don't need this. We don't need this. So what happens when, when a request comes from the outside world, we hit some router that translate it, translates it uh, into the Docker address, uh, port address. So there is the application running, and it responds it responds with uh, with the response and sends it back to the uh, back to the uh, to the to the client. What we need to do to be to have a B, we need to create some uh, some other route that will hit this deployment, the deployment A, but also a new deployment that would be B. So when I get the get the request, it gets either here or there, and then I get some response and back to the client. And this one is also will be also accessible on its own uh, on its own route. So I'm expo I'm, I will expose only A, only B, or A or B. Does it make sense? Okay. So to make to do that, uh, we need to run a single command. That's a bit longer. So, cd uh, oc project ab. You might want to bump up the font. Sorry? Font. Again? Okay. And I will run a command like this. So what I'm going to do is to use this, <coughs> this router and generate a new one that will provide me the, the, the I will copy this one into that one, essentially. Nothing, nothing difficult. Now when I switch back, you see that I have new AB service and I have the original service as well, right? So the next thing that we need to speak about is labels. Is there anyone else who would like to tell me something about labels in Kubernetes and OpenShift? Now, services, we didn't speak about services yet, right? Or did we? No. So services, and so we spoke about pods. So services are load balancer. Services are load balancer. If I have more pods, or more containers running the service, and I hit the, I hate this terminology because you use the same word for two different things. You have the application running in the pod, and you, the service is a load balancer. If you have multiple ports, you will hit one of those. It's a simple TCP, TCP based load balancer. Uh, but how it works is it uses labels. So label is a very simple naming convention for Kubernetes where you take uh, name and value and you tag a resource and then you can select those resources based on those tags. Does that make sense? Just say no if, if, it, if it doesn't make sense. That's completely okay. Because I was expecting more people coming from the morning session, so we are getting a bit too high to, to more advanced topics without having the basics. So we are just doing the basics in a very simple, you know, squashed uh, version. So the labels, tags that I can put on different ports, on different services, or on different uh, uh, replication controllers, which is the last resource that we need to speak about. So what I can do, browse, Pods, open a pod. This is the build that we that build up that provided the new runnable image for us. And I can also I also have the pod that, run, that runs the application itself. That's the PHP application. I can see check logs. So you see that there was a request uh, to my application, and there was a request to Favicon as well. That's because the browser always asks for Favicon as well as uh, as for the application itself. So this is my port, and you see the blue things over here. Is it readable for you? Yes. So those are labels. Uh, these things are the labels. So my port is labeled app 
ABPA. This is the name, this is the value. This is the name, this is the value. This is the name, this is the value. So you see that there is uh, three different uh, labels. If I get to a service, <coughs> and my service is APPA, you will see that there is a selector. The selector says that deployment config has to equal to APPA. So this service will be load balancing all, all the pods, any pod in the cluster, in the, let's say in the, in the project, that will have uh, the, uh, the label deployment config equals APPA. You can also put the multiple uh, labels. In that case, you are, you are narrowing the search for, for a more specific, specific pod. So this service goes only to deployment config APPA. When I go to my uh, AB service, this one is using AB equals true. So is there, a, is there some pod that would have AB equals true? No, not at this time. So what do I have to do? Nice. So I will go to my deployment config. That this is the this is the configuration of the deployment of the application A, and I will change it. So this is painful. We are working on a more nicer form way of editing these files. Uh, it was, I think, this week, Steve. Do you remember when uh, Jacob was committing the, the form editor for deployment configs and build configs? Build configs, I think he said it was going in this release of Origin. Yeah. So I think it'll be in Enterprise. It'll probably be in 3.2. Probably. So in the next version, we will have a nice clicky way of editing these files. But at this time, we have to go on the raw Kubernetes level and edit the YAML or JSON file. But in our case, it's, it, uh, it's the YAML. So my deployment config says that there is a template for my containers that will be deployed through this deploy using this configuration. And all the, and the containers are going to have, where is it? Over here, uh, labels. APPA, APP equals APPA and deployment config equals APPA. So what I'm going to do, add new label. AB true. That's the one that the AP service is looking for. Any pod that has this label. I'm going to save it, and you will see that there is a new deployment running. Because I have a, uh, somewhere here, I'm going to have uh, triggers, and when I change the config, I'm going to redeploy my application. So, it's happening, something's going on. I deployed the application again, and when you check the overview, now I see in the AB service one pod. Because now the pod that was redeployed, uh, which is this one, has also the AB true. So I check. Upon redeployment, the previous deployment instance was killed? Yes, so we created, we deployed a new container, we relabeled it, and then we tear down the previous one. So it did it happen automatically? Yes. Because I have, the, I have the trigger there that when the config changes, I should redeploy all the containers that inherit from this configuration. Mm -hmm. So that happened automatically. So right now, I have uh, one service, AB, that goes to this, to this pod. And I, at the same time, I have the service APPA that goes to the same pod. There is only one pod, one container at this time. So uh, when you scale the pods, do you scale the pod? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. So I scale the pod, still the, the labels are there, so the service uh, AB will consume both of those pods. Why it's halfway? Because it's still waiting for the pod to start. So it knows that the container was... Kubernetes said to the Docker, hey, start me the, the container, so that's why I got the two, and I'm waiting for the local container to actually start. Kind of slow. It's kind of slow. The deployment was faster. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, there are we have two problems here. The cluster sometimes fails for us because we have been using for the whole day for different bunch of people for different demos. So sometimes we have a uh, glitch there. The other one is that the Wi-Fi and internet sucks. And so this is a web you know, socket driven 
Yeah. So if the WebSocket connection drops, it won't get an update here. It looks like even with the reload. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Browse. Yeah. So let's check what's happening actually. So we are we are pending the pod. We are waiting for the pod to start. Can we check the logs? Mm. Oh, yeah. Nothing's happening there. No. Interesting. Steve, this is pretty much the same problem you had before. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> you see? Oh. So now we, we scale to three. Uh, if I scale down, one of those spots is going to be killed. Let's hope it's the one that, that's <laughs> problematic. I do have that backup server. But I know you've already created this stuff, so... Yeah. Is that CZ? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's the only difference. Yeah. Yeah. But let's check what uh, OC get pods. So we can list all the pods. There is one that's being terminated. OC uh, delete pod. Let's see if this does something. Was deleted. Mm. Ah, it's the same problem. We will have to wait for the timeout. And then, the like, for some reason, uh, I think there's some problematic node uh, that happened as well when we were doing the, the previous one. There was a user uh, that was, when, when uh, Ryan was provisioning the, the nodes, uh, he provisioned a user, a sample users. And user 61 had a problem during the deployment. And he was redeploying and redeploying and redeploying the sample application that was deployed there. So since two days ago, we did, we did 729 deployments. <laughs> so we probably generated 729 different images, Docker images, that are lying somewhere in the cluster. Uh, and when I was trying to clean it, I cleaned all the deployments, but I couldn't clean the images because I didn't have uh, access rights for that. Yes? Uh, so question. There is some way how to automatically clean up the Docker uh, I'm I'm running all, the all all all, all, all the okay. stopped containers because you already st uh, c c create one but not clean up the old one. So there is a prune command on for the administrators. Uh, right now there is no scheduled or anything like <coughs> scheduling or anything like that. You have to run it manually. Yeah. Uh, there is some uh, automatic pruning if you reach uh, if you reach some limit then it can be it can be triggered. Uh -huh. But it's not automatically run like every hour or something. You can trigger it manually. You can. It's like uh, OADM prune images dash dash confirm. It's a command like that. You can put it into Chrome or something and run it every hour. So it's it's OADM OADM command. It's in ODM. Okay. It's a, this is only for administrators. The users cannot prune. Uh, that might be sec from security point of view, it could be problematic sometimes when users start pruning. Yeah, true. Yeah, and also we try to keep uh, as many uh, artifacts as possible for uh, rollbacks. So if there is some problematic deployment, so you can roll back uh, with your application. But I think that the old deploy is 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 is, uh, is like uh, image, not container. Every deployment is new image. Every deployment is a new, yes. Um, it doesn't have to be. Uh, you can deploy containers without the build process. In yeah. that case, it will be the same image. If you are deploying, like, you can say, deploy me a new container from Docker Hub. In that case, we don't build a new image. We just deploy the, Im we pull it, and then we yeah, deploy I it. mean, like, source to image. If you have source to image, uh, it is not, history. even there, it is not for every deployment. Uh, it is for every build. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But there were as many builds as deployments in the, in the, in the user. So there was some problem with fetching source code, I don't know, but there was some problem. Okay. Yeah, but you, during, so the process is you, have, you trigger the build, when the build finishes, it can trigger a deployment, and the deployment then redeploys the, con the Docker containers in the cluster. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, deployments and replication controllers mm -hmm. uh, from a Kubernetes perspective. Okay. Yeah. yeah. One to one? No. One to n. You have one deployment config, it can have multiple replication controllers. I mean, each time we do a deployment, yes. a RC and is created. Though. Yes. Yeah. So, like, the deployment is pretty much a replication controller. Okay. So, hopefully this will end up somehow, our scaling process.
But you have seen that we can actually scale if we hit the correct node, not the, not the faulty one. Try, try refreshing and see. I just print the images. Okay. Yeah, yeah. there is a warning. So we, the, it timed oh, out. Timed out, yeah. So there we go. Uh, what, was, what was I doing? Okay. So we have the application. So by default, anything that you create is not accessible from the outside world. If I click over here, there is no route. It just shows me uh, the service itself. I can create a route. Route is an entry point from the outside world to the cluster. So I create a new route. And I don't like it here. Let's do it on the command line. If you don't mind, I prefer command line. Is it OK for you? It's fine. OK. OC uh, get <coughs> services. So I see what services I do have here. There is the AB service. So I can do OC expose service AB. And this one creates me a new route. So right now I have already the URL generated and linked to the, to the service. So when I open this, I should be able to hit A. And yeah, A as well. Because it points on the all, all the A containers that I have already deployed. So the next thing is, I need to deploy the application B, the new one. That will be uh, the new deployment. And I have my application A, A still running. And whenever I hit it, some of the people will hit the A, and some will hit the new B. OK. My application B is as complex as the application A. Right. So there you can see what's the source code for the application. I will take the source URL. I go back to the to here. I will add to project. I will choose. This time I can choose PHP 5.6. It doesn't matter. It, it was 5.5 .5 before. Now I can use 5.3, for example. There is there is no limit on the technology that you want to use. You can have application A to be PHP. Application B can be <coughs> Java. And you can use it just just fine. It's a container. It, the, the system doesn't care about what's inside that container. So that, that's nice. Uh, so it's app b. This is my source code. Let's create. Continue to overview. And we have a build running. I can again go to the log. So something's happening. Something's happening. Container finished. I am removing. I'm cleaning up. I'm pushing to the repo. Pushing to the repo. Once that happens, I will pull it to one of the nodes, and I will spin it up as a new application. Come on, be nice. Okay, successfully pushed. So I can go to overview, and I can see that my IPPB has been deployed. One pot is there. And my AB service doesn't see the application. Why? Label. Because I forgot the label. So what I wanted to do, actually, like what I was thinking about something else, is do it over here. And you can specify the label just during the deployment. So I, didn't do, I did not do it, which means I need to go back to the deployments. Uh, APPB, I need to edit it my, myself and add AB equals true. You need to put the, the quotes there because uh, Go or the YAML parser actually interprets true as the Boolean value and this uh, labels expect string and string. So the, the Boolean is not compatible with the string uh, that's expected. So you need to put uh, the quotes over there. I save it. And the deployment was triggered, and I'm just waiting for the application to redeploy. And here we go. So our AB service now points to all those in APP, APPA and to all those in APPB. Uh, and now I have these two uh, just specific, up, specifically application uh, access points. When I refresh my browser with the AB, AB-AB, I always hit A. Why? Session. session affinity, yes. So by default, we have session affinity. What I can do, take this URL, go to my command line, B, A, A, B, A, A, B. I have two A's and one B. So I go straight, uh, straight down. 
Now I can go back to my browser, I'll scale down A to 0, I'll scale up my B, whatever, and now I will be hitting only the Bs. Right, so I did the AB deployment, I had the application A, then I had AB, I could scale down slowly and scale up slow, uh, slowly, and then I would only have the Bs. Can, so, you, can, can, you, can, <laughs> can you change the ratio of what you are hitting which application if you want, for example, 10% of requests to, to land on B and just 90% to land on A? That's a good question. Uh, yes and yes, we can. Uh, it's not, not that easy. The thing is, uh, by default, what we are using is HA proxy. So H and it's a <coughs> round robin load balancer by default, the configuration. Uh, so by default, you just go one, 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 one. Uh, what you can do is change the configuration onto HA proxy. To put, you can put that your own configuration. In that case, you can change the behavior of the load balancer from round robin to something else. You can change the session affinity, you can change any configuration that is connected with the load balancer. And in that case, you can change the ratios, maybe based on some labels, maybe based on something else. Uh, but you can do it. It's just not there. This is, this is a use case that uses a lo lower level things to do some high level deployment. <coughs> and what you're asking for is an even higher level deployment. So you need to change something else in the configuration. Uh, what we have is the... <coughs> Canary deployments, right? I always forget the name. Canary deployments. So when you are deploying a new version of the application, so you can have, uh, let me go back. When I go to my APPA, for example, uh, so maximum unavailable and maximum search, it configures the how many can, will be taken down by default and how many, uh, how fast they will be for deployed. So you can do like, whenever I push a new version of the source code, uh, trigger me a build, and then when you are deploying the new build image, do it in steps of 10% for a time of, I don't know, five days, something like that. Yeah, but these ratios refer to number of uh, pods, number of containers. Number right? of containers, yes. Mm -hmm. Number of the pods, not containers, the pods uh, that are <coughs> connected to the deployment config. <coughs> so this can be done for the same application, what you are asking for, just simple as this. If you want to do like, PHP or Java or two different applications, you would need to go through the more complex way as I did. In that case, you would need to change the HA proxy router. So the HA proxy router is a container by itself that's, that's deployed in OpenShift as a pod. Uh, it's managed by Kubernetes. Uh, it's running uh, on, in our case, it's running on a special infra node. So our nodes have a different labels. Uh, there is a master node, there is infra node, like infrastructure and demo nodes. That's where I'm deploying my, my pods. And different containers can have different policies what nodes they should choose when they are being deployed. So in, on my infra node, I have the container with HA proxy, with the, and I have there as well the Docker registry. That's also a container running on OpenChip, managed by OpenChip. As an administrator, I could just go, delete the, the pod, and it would be redeployed as any other different pod. If I want to start my own OpenShift on uh, Amazon, is there something, is there some kind of easiest ways like uh, running CloudFormation template and just having everything done? Uh, I am not sure if, if we have already CloudFormation slash heat uh, template, mm -hmm. uh, but what we have and what's quite nice is uh, OpenShift Ansible project. So if we, uh, if, do you know Ansible? Everybody knows Ansible? Who doesn't know Ansible? Okay, so do you know Puppet? Do you know Chef? Okay, so to manage, con to manage servers on a scale, you don't want to SSH into single one and change it like by hand. You want to have a tool that will push the configuration, that will manage the configuration of the servers automatically. So there are different tools that could do that, and Ansible is one of those. Uh, Red Hat actually acquired uh, Ansible uh, half a year ago, so it's now a Red Hat company. Uh, and we are using Ansible for management uh, for, like, I think the official installation method is the Ansible script. There is a wrapper that it looks like a command, but it runs Ansible on the, uh, underneath. 
and there is a configuration to use it with AWS, GCE, and local VMs. So you can just configure your uh, your uh, credentials. Uh, you say how many VMs should be provisioned for uh, deployment, for infrastructure, for etcd, etc. It will create the uh, the VMs on one of those, and then it will configure the VMs as well. So that's probably the simplest one, and you choose if you want to use enterprise or origin. Origin is the open source project, so that's upstream to enterprise, and enterprise is the product. So if you are the brave guy who wants to play with the all the latest cool stuff, origin is for you. If you want a super stable version that is used for enterprises, then can you buy the enterprise and you you can one of the nice benefits is when, when it doesn't work, you can call Red Hat and yell at us that it doesn't work. Yeah. You can even blame us. So the, there is enterprise and origin. And these are open source, uh, the scripts. So if you want to run and, and deploy OpenShift, this is probably the simplest way. If you do it if you want to do it by hand, uh, it's not that difficult. Uh, and if you try op uh, OpenShift V2, the previous version, no? it was written in Ruby and it had so many dependencies all over the place, so it wasn't that easy to deploy it. Uh, with uh, V3, it's a Go binary that pretty much contains everything. The whole OpenShift can be one binary. Uh, you just download it, you run it, and it does all the. If you run it under S root, and it configures also the system, so that's the only one deployment that's possible. Uh, and if you want to do it by hand, you can download the, the, uh, the binary to multiple systems. You spin up one as master, you spin up the other ones as nodes, you connect them together. But you then need to also configure the networking, uh, you need to configure storage, etc. And these more complex deployment things can be done using the Ansible much simpler. Like deploying the OpenShift part, that's easy. Deploying the underlying technologies like OpenVSwitch, or some other software-defined networking for virtual isolation of the networks, uh, some uh, distributed storage like cluster, Ceph, or NFS for using the persistent volumes. So you can write on one node and it's accessible on the other nodes. Or actually, if you want to just uh, have uh, data that's uh, that's persisted of between the restarts of the of the containers, you need the persistent volumes for that. So for that, you need some different technology that provides you with the capabilities to do the persistent storage. So that's the most challenging part of the, the most challenging part of deploying OpenShift. All the underlying technologies. And then you run just two binaries. I think the big, biggest pain is, is at the CD. EDCD? Yeah, those certificates. Uh, yes, that's pain. Though again, <laughs> if you run Ansible, Ansible, it generates all the certificates yes. and distributes them on the, all the machines mm -hmm. and configures everything so it works. Yes. So the Ansible scripts are the best. Uh, Ryan, I think you have been using this for provisioning these VMs, right? That we are using for the this, workshop. This is the best for uh, the upstream uh, origin code. There's also another repo if you want to deploy uh, specifically to Amazon <coughs> using uh, Enterprise, OpenShift Enterprise. Talk to me, uh, I'll give you a URL to a different, uh, there's another repo that I use uh, for Enterprise. But this is upstream for you. This is the upstream, yeah, yeah. And my mine uses this anyway. So yeah. <coughs> the simplification for specific deployment. Uh, yeah. uh, it will be in future possible to install on uh, like Raran in Firewall D because this script uh, shut down Firewall D and start IP tables. And yes. Firewall D is like based on RAL seven, so this yeah. does not, not, not make sense. I think you can you can run firewall D. The problem is not the yes, firewall D itself. Firewall D, the problem is that firewall D sometimes does things that we don't want because we need to create a virtual network. We need to create the, the routing between different ports. We need to create the VLANs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which firewall D sometimes like interferes with. So firewall D is problematic a bit in our in our because. In our case, because firewall is a nice, simple way to manage firewall. Yes. We need the complex configuration that changes a lot, like very often. You, if you do firewall D and you make sure it doesn't interfere with, with us, it's okay. You can run it. I think it's it's a it's a different thing. Um, there's a I, I don't know what the current status, but there was a pull request of stream. Yeah, I saw saw that it will be like a pull request to allow Docker use. 
it's working in the uh, 1.9 or something. Of the pair? Yeah. It could be, uh, but it is, uh, it's the but the other thing is that uh, Docker is probably using the lib network, or whatever they call it, uh, which Kubernetes is not using. So yeah. the networking stack that Docker is using is not compatible with the Kubernetes one. So you need support in Kubernetes for Firewall D to actually work, make it work with OpenShift, not on the Docker level. Because there were some, and there's a blog post if you want to Google it why. There are some technical yes. and political reasons why not. Yeah, and the end of the blog post is that uh, new Docker will be DNS built in, and no one knows it should be turned off. So be. are you thinking to switch off from Docker to Rocket or something? <laughs> Uh, you're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> like, my personal opinion? Yeah. I would love to. I don't like Docker, personally. Like building but DNS from in from the from open chip, no, not just generally Docker's politics and behavior. I don't like it. But I speaking for myself personally, from the Red Hat point of view, I don't know. Uh, I don't have insight into the roadmaps, etc. And I don't want to because I always say something in these presentations that it's sometimes confidential and I should not say. So I don't look at roadmaps. So I don't know. <laughs> it might be there. It might not. No idea. Uh, okay. What's the time? So we are in half of the workshop. Maybe a bit more, oh, slightly yeah. more. Okay. So what else would you like to see? So you saw, uh, you have seen the AB deployment. <coughs> we have spoken about a lot of stuff uh, that's low level, high level. Some other questions that you have that I can answer, or maybe try to answer at least? It's maybe too, too big of a new question. Could you like just maybe do a real quick walkthrough of how you create a set of services that talk together, like a, a little Node.js app that's going to come back to MongoDB, or to MySQL that I can, or just something to... Okay. To put kind of a I think we can do that. Uh, would you, if you don't mind, I would use the, the, work, the materials for the workshop that I have prepared. The, the basic go through using OpenShift. Uh, we are using, uh, it's a Java application that's being deployed to EAP and it's, it is using uh, MongoDB on the backend uh, to store the data and then shows a map of all the MLB parts in the United States. And I would love to ask Grant over there if you can uh, explain what MLB parts are because we in Europe don't play baseball at much. I've, I've got an <laughs> alternate version that's Node.js with uh, I don't like no chance. It's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's MLB? Just oh, well, explain MLB. MLB is major league baseball. So, so what I did is I created a geospatial uh, application using OpenStreetMap and Leaflet. So all the baseball stadiums, uh, depending on the longitude and latitude coordinates at the corners of your web browser. So each time you change the map or drag around, it does a REST API call to get the longitude and latitude that's displayed in your browser, and then does a REST query to MongoDB to do a box query. I know that sounds complicated. Okay, so what it is is it's just a map of all the. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, so we are using the source to image again uh, because we don't have a pre-built image and uh, there is a source code somewhere, uh, let me check, over here. And the username can be changed for somebody else's username on GitHub. I am using, I will use gshipley, which is the guy that just explained to you what MLB parts are about and who created the, created the application. So uh, I will use his source code. And when I go to uh, over here, uh, add to project, uh, where is my JBoss? JBoss EAP, I will call it MLB parts, the, the, the source code, and create. So what's going to happen is I'm going, it, it will start building the application, or pulling the source code, building the application. If I go to the logs, I will, you will see, I can follow. So you see that we are downloading all the internets through Maven. So again, you need to download everything. 
Uh, once this happens, uh, we will have the image, we will deploy the image. Uh, the image can consume some environment variables that point to the, that authenticate against the MongoDB service that we will also deploy. And then uh, we will redeploy the application to actually consume those environment variables and connect to the MongoDB server. So we need to wait for this uh, to happen. Mayor, for that building, you can show the one that's already running under user 00. Is there? Yeah, it's in a project called the non Parks. OK. Mm, let's see, MLB Parks. And if I open it, OK, this is, the, this is the result. So this is the map, and the points are the parks that you, they, the US guys play baseball at. Uh, and if you click it, you get some basic information about, okay, $73 million is a team payroll for Rockies in, the, in Dallas, in Denver. Some basic information. So that's the, that's the result. So then if you zoom in. If I zoom in. Five times. Each time the map changes, like I was telling you, it gets the coordinates from the four corners and makes a rest call to just pull back the data within that uh, location. Yeah. That makes sense. Within and some. Okay, you can see it at the back, but it's doing the within query uh, with some position and give me give me everything in this rectangle. Some geo query on the MongoDB. How is our build going? Let's go back to ABs. Uh, still going. Follow. Pushing image. I can. I can. Uh, but I, I don't really need to pull Mongo. I will just go here. I will look for Mongo. Uh, because I don't have. Uh, my uh, persistent storage configured at all in my cluster. I will not use a persistent MongoDB, but a container that just saves to the, to the file system. Whenever mm -hmm. the container starts, it loses all the data. But it's okay for our simple example. There is a MongoDB, uh, and we can populate the information, the environment variables that will be pushed into the container when it starts. And when it starts, it, it configures a user, with this username, with this password, it creates this database and creates an admin a user with this password as well. I'm going to check in the, in the tutorial, because I don't remember it, the application expects something uh, from me to do and choose some specific values, which is MLB parts for all of those. Okay. MLB parts, MLB parts, MLB parts, MLB parts. Uh, some labels, I don't need that. Period. Continue. So let's see. There is my MLB parts application, and there is my MongoDB one. So I deployed. I yes, I built. I will. I have built my source code. I have deployed the application. EAP is probably still starting, uh, and I. I have I had the Docker, the MongoDB image precast on the system, on on the node. I do it just to make it simple and doesn't take that, that long to pull it from Docker Hub all the time. Uh, and I spin it up. So when it's spinned up, it created the, the users and the admin user with the specific information that that we put there in the into the form. What about the MongoDB cluster? Like you spin up the MongoDB, it just makes the cluster, and we have two or more nodes. Yeah, uh, I think in origin there is MongoDB cluster, uh, some work on it, uh, with just with charting, uh, and they work on it and they curse all the time, the engineers. So there is work in pro progress for that. Um, we have as well MySQL cluster in the in the origin repo. Uh, Master slave. We have examples, template examples. Yeah. Just some control node, and they have to cluster from behind. And how, yeah. are we de how are we dealing with storage on the database? With MongoDB, I don't really know how they handle the storage. Because I asked in previous talk, and because we are uh, we are trying to solve this, and I have answered that there is no like uh, uh, 
there be no like some uh, or um, like it's just not the way to do it. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like we, we want to have Mongos on OpenShift, mm -hmm. but there is no 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 use case how to run like in a clean way. Pot, for example. Okay. Yeah, we do have. If you do add to project, there's two types of Mongo uh, mm -hmm. that are listed. There's an ephemeral and a persistent. The persistent template for Mongo uses a persistent volume flame. Um, I to, know. Yeah, but, but then still for performance reason, I need to run yeah. the same disk and this is on the node. So you can use a node selector to ensure that that pod always lands on your. Big hardware with a faster disk. But, but yeah. based on based on documentation, hotspot is for for only for testing. Mm. Mm. So I don't know. From MongoDB, I will work with our engineers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like the MongoDB is quite, yeah, challenging. I know that uh, we have we had the winter of code. Is the T-shirt that you were give, get, getting uh, during the day? And the guys from Spain, from a company called Produban, they created a Cassandra cluster. Uh, so when you spin up, you, you deploy a master. I think you deploy a master for some reason. It should probably work with uh, just everything on the same <coughs> level, but they have a master and uh, slave nodes. And as you scale slaves, uh, it redistributes the data among the, uh, among the, the nodes. <coughs> so there is no need for persistent storage in there because when you create a new one, just the, the, the ring is changed and the data moves in the cluster by default. So in that case, it works quite nicely. The, the other problem is we hide everything behind the load balancing services. Uh, in Cassandra, you usually want to connect to the closest node, and then it gossips you to the correct uh, correct place. So from performance uh, point of view, you don't want to have the load balancer into Cassandra. So yeah. you s solve one problem, and you create a new one. So all these persistent storages, all the databases, like are not yet that much suitable for horizontal scalability, right? You still need to take care of this my nice shiny machine that is running my storage. I, there have been people who have been running um, HDFS and the thing from their uh, HBase, HBase uh, on OpenShift using OpenShift to scale it. Which one? HBase. <coughs> HBase. Yeah. What is that? It's a. It's yeah. The, it's a, Directly from the uh, from the Hadoop project, um, I have heard told some uh, on Origin, not on not enterprise customer. By the way, if you click to the scale button on this uh, MongoDB, it's like broke the application or something. I don't know what that was going to happen. <laughs> you want to try it? Well, as long as the storage is ephemeral, you get two databases. Probably, yes. yeah, with a little balancer. Uh, no, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Ah, okay. So we, our application over here should be running. We have a map without any data. And we have the database server running over here. And if you click on the pod, uh, on the pod, uh, you should be able to see, uh, it's not here, it's not here, uh, all the environment variables. They should be somewhere. Let me check. Ah, never mind. When you click somewhere in the user interface, you will get a list all, of all the environment variables that are pushed inside that, that container. You need to click on the container box. Deploy, uh, on this one? Yeah. Yeah, consider. Is it here? It's in the no. Good, yeah. good, good, over there. <coughs> environment variables. So that, that's the things that we configured using the, the form. So our, it was, I clicked over on the MongoDB. So MongoDB was uh, configured with these. And I can click over here and I have no environment variables. So not yet, my application doesn't know how to connect to the, to the MongoDB yet. Is it possible to hide some environment, like the password? Uh, you can use the secrets, and then the secrets will be mounted inside the container, not through environment variables, but as a file on the file system, and you read it from there. Yeah, it's possible to like bring some secret to some user, because I need to uh, create a secret for every project again. Uh, just for a specific user, for example, or something else. I think so because when you are when you are doing when you want to use want to use a private repo, for example, for GitHub, 
You mm -hmm. configure uh, yes. the as a secret. You configure the SSH key yes. for a specific user, and everywhere the user is being used, it uses this uh, particular key. Okay. So it should be per possible to do it per user. Okay. The next step is to link it together. Okay. So what I need to do, I will run the command on. Uh, on the command line, uh, yeah. So on my deployment config, I uh, change these environment variables. When I change the deployment config, it will trigger a, a redeployment of the container. I know I have a wrong name there. Uh, uh, it will trigger the redeployment of the container so that the container can consume the new environment variables because you cannot push uh, environment variables into existing processes. They need to inherit from, from the parent. Right. So I named uh, my project uh, MLB Parks and so I need to rename my deployment config to MLB Parks. And deployment config was changed and my application is being redeployed and the new container is going to have these environment variables pushed in so once my application starts uh, it will be able to connect to the uh, MongoDB. So that's the basic workflow that, that you do. Okay, and these, uh, uh, the environment variables can, can they reference like other, like other, uh, other pods or like you? Yeah, um, like if I you can. can. Uh, I will show you something. Um, if I do uh, OC new app, mm. oh, sorry, oh, no, sorry, OC new app uh, Kubernetes slash guest uh, guest book. I deploy a new application. Uh, that's a Docker image. Mm -hmm. Now, really? Okay. Three O's. You know, I am reading Terry Pratchett, and I have, I have all the O's everywhere. <laughs> uh, so, I am deploying an image from uh, Docker Hub. It will be pulled, it will be started, and I will have a new, uh, new application available. It's this guest book. It's already running. So, I create a new route for it. Uh, I don't like this. OC get service, OC expose guest book. Service. No, oh, service guest book. So now I will have, uh, where's my <coughs> guest book? Guest book has URL, there's the application. You go to environment variables and you see that for every service that we have created in the project, uh, you get port, you get host, the different naming conventions using environment variables. So every service that's inside this project as my application, mm -hmm. all the connection para all the connection information, port and host, is pushed into all the containers in the same project. Uh, so I can just uh, discover it using the name, like based on the name. As well, if I want to connect to Kubernetes or OpenShift, uh, I have the information how to connect there and. I have a secret uh, saved on the on the node in every uh, in every container, so I can authenticate as the user who deployed the application and see what's happening there in the cluster. So you can connect out back <coughs> to the to the cluster. Okay. So this is used for discovery. Uh, the other possibility is uh, give me the pod. This pod terminal. I can now I am connected to the like SSH inside the container, so I'm working with the internal, internally in the container, and if I do get um, ETC, etc host, there should be, there is my, my username, and as well, uh, uh, get etc resolve.conf, there are different name servers, and these name servers are internal to OpenShift, and you do different queries on the DNS servers to discover different things. So you can, I think there, there is definitely you can discover the, by specific names, you can discover uh, different services that are in the same project. 
uh, and I think there's already SR SRV uh, entries as well, so you can also discover not only the IP address but also the ports. Because by default, by using DNS, you cannot discover the port. You can only discover the IP address. In the in environment variables, you have both by default. It's shared the DNS server, or it's better? No, it's shared. It connects <coughs> out to the. It's it's part of the of the platform itself. It's, I, think, I am quite sure that this can be configurable. So if you want to use some different uh, name server that we are using internally, you can replace it. As well, if you want to use something else than, than HA proxy for the load balancing, you can just replace the container with some other container. It just has to be able to do all the stuff that you're expecting it to do. I'm asking about, uh, because uh, you, don't, you couldn't search something you shouldn't know. Right? Yes. The information about other ports. Yeah, there's, it should not, yes. I'm not sure how that's, that's handled. I haven't had time to play with it. It's quite a new feature. So I just know it's there. I, I still need to get into it. This was uh, in the latest, this is the part of the latest, deploy, uh, latest version. Uh, I think you, they, you can check uh, what is the source address of that particular query. And based on that, you can know who is asking for what. Uh, but I'm not sure. Well, something like that, probably. Um, so that's for the discovery. So you have two different options, through DNS or through uh, environment variables. OK, yeah, our the, uh, the, the vagrant images, they use xit.io to handle all of that. So yes. it's configurable and plug that in. For external. Pretty much all those co different components that we are using are replaceable by something else. If you don't want to use HA proxy, you can use the big F5s or some other hardware load balancers. If you don't want to use OpenV switch for the software defined networking, you can switch for something else. This is plugins that you can change yourself. We are providing uh, some default configuration, but if you have already some existing deployments in your company and you want to hook into your existing infrastructure, we are trying, we will help you with that. Were you saying you didn't want certain services to be seen, you could put them in a separate project uh, This might might work. You only see things within your project scope. So, uh, and there's also support for additional network isolation per project. If you want, you could do a dedicated VXLAN per project. Okay, where's my application? Never mind. Uh, ABs, 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 guestbook, MLB parks. And I have the points there. So I connected back to the uh, MongoDB and I was able to read the data. Now the question is, where did I get the data? It just appeared somewhere. In the Java in the in the created by building the application, there was some initial data. Not really. Uh, when I'm building the application itself, I don't. I have now. I didn't have, but now with the new releases, uh, I have access to the services in the same uh, in the same project. Uh, but I cannot be sure that the MongoDB is already running when I'm building the application. So if I would populate the data, that, that, that some script or some data state through the building, I'm just containing the final image. It's not going now. No, you should never po try to populate the data from in the building phase because you have no idea yeah, if yeah, the yeah. other services are running. So. No building it's phase. In, it's it's in not the, in the build phase. In the running phase. It's in the running phase. Uh, so there is some way. The Java hook. There must be something. Okay. It's, I think it's over here. So it, it there is no connection to OpenShift with that. <laughs> uh, it's as simple as if. I connect, and if there is no uh, no documents in the collection with the parks, I download this JSON file, parse it, and upload it back to the to the database. So when the application connects to the MongoDB, it checks if the data is there. If it's not there, it populates the database. It is great with the ephemeral storage because whenever I connect, I get the data there, and it it always seems to be there some somehow. So it's, it's, a, it's a trick uh, to make it work, uh, but this is not a good practice at all, to do it like this when in the open game. So for example, if you ha when, you have a, when you have a Rails applications or Django, we have pre-deployed hooks 
which you configure for the deployment. So whenever the deployment is going to be started, you can trigger, you say, this is, use this image and run this command in it. And that could be Rails migrate or Django migrate. So before the, the deployment starts, you run the migration. And if it completes correctly with, with uh, zero exit code, then the, the deployment <coughs> starts. If it fails, it will not start the deployment at all. Then you can have post deployment hook. So when all the uh, containers have been re redeployed, you trigger this, uh, this command in the container. If it doesn't fail, it's OK. We are keeping it. If it fails, we roll back all the containers back to the previous version. So you have two different ways how to do it. But you should not do it in the build phase. Because in the build phase, you have no idea what's inside the cluster. So in the build phase, what we do is to generate, you can, like, again, in, I'm a Rails guy, right? Rails guy, so actually, it's my favorite example. So what you do is, you generate the asset, uh, static assets, you compress them into a gzip or something, you do all those things that generate some, something on the, in the application. But you don't, you don't touch the other things in the cluster, not yet. That's part of the deployment phase. The same thing is, if you would want to do, you don't have to trigger the deployment. When you, when you finish the build, you don't have to trigger the deployment automatically. You can have the new image built, and when, it, when you want, you can manually trigger the, the deployment. If you would do the migration as part of the build phase, you would already migrate your database, but the, but the code itself could be deployed like months later. So you want to do the migration as part of the, de of the deployment phase when you are moving to the new version. So did I answer your question with the linking and deploying stuff? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think I have to look back. And, like, where, where are those environment variables stored on Linux? Is that the block environment? Or is, it, is there something I have to do to like, <sighs> pull those in? Or? Uh, you configure them on the deployment config in, in OpenShift, and then we make sure to push them in all the containers. Right. So when my, oh, my app will be running that. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so how is the time? Eight minutes. Eight minutes left. Some other questions? Cool. Uh, it's possible to figure out somehow uh, the footprint of the system, like the, uh, uh, like how much resources using OpenShift on my own? Uh, my own? Yeah. Oh, yeah, like OpenShift itself. It's, uh, itself. I am not sure if this is part of the metrics. Uh, if, if it rip we have a metrics project that's, that uh, sends back all the metrics information like memory, CPU, etc. back to Cassandra somewhere, and then you have a UI to read it from there. I'm not sure if this is if uh, like etcde and uh, Kubelet and these things are included in there, uh, but might be. I might be. I'm not sure. I, I can see the usage in top or something else. Yes. But it's, I and can recognize it the application from to uh, OpenShift. Yeah. Uh, I think it could be possible to send it through the metrics, uh, but I'm not sure. Okay. The same is uh, if you want to do the logs, like C logs from containers, C logs from uh, the nodes, etc. Uh, we have the integration with FluentD that sends all the information to Elasticsearch. And then you can use something. We, we by default, use Kibana to go through the logs so you can analyze them and see what's happening in one place. Yeah, I want to uh, one thing. Uh, what is really missing to, you can uh, run OC logs and run the name of the pod. Yeah. And I need to follow three pods in the same time and I check what is happening. It's you could do possible. that with the elastic part, with the logs. Because the what you see say is the basic part of OpenShift. Yes. That's there. If you put the FluentD there and you use the Elasticsearch, you will have real time stream of the logs, uh -huh. and you will be able to look it up from the Elasticsearch. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> uh, uh, mm -hmm. Question: I, I look at the main page with the pricing list and things about the limits, and I don't see there anything about uh, operating the RAM, about the, how much I could use and how much the system uses and things. That's a good question. I have no idea. As I said, I'm not a sales it's, guy, so... It's, it's quite, no, no, okay. Leave the, the price part. Okay. How could I see how much memory I have and what's the limit in the system? 
in the system. So again, uh, you can use the metrics to stream it into some user interface. Uh, the other thing is, um, what I because we had the problem with the cluster before, so I was trying to see what's happening uh, with our applications and our cluster. So I was... Are you asking on a user level basis or system basis? User. Okay. So in the user, if you go to the settings here... Ooh. Settings of what? In the web console. Ah! I just closed my web console. <laughs> so there's this concept ah. of a uh, quote that they add to oh. the Apple Shift Tab. Open Shift Dishmaster. Apple Shift Tab. Maybe hold down Shift and you tab. Over here. Reopen the last. Whatever CPU utilization percentage-wise you're able to use. Go to the project and settings. Settings on the left. Yeah, but we don't have quotas here. We don't have them enabled for our cluster, yeah. but if your admin has them enabled, it'll say like two gigs memory, two vCPUs or something like that. And then you can allocate those to your containers as you see fit or to your pods. Does that make sense? Yeah, great, thanks. Just I didn't, for all the, session, all the last two sessions, I didn't see any information. Yeah, can, we have it disabled. <laughs> like in, okay. in these sessions, you're able to use as much as you as physically <laughs> So if you care actually about how your like uh, what the uh, cluster looks like, not from the user perspective, but from the admin sysadmin perspective, uh, so this gives me so there's a command that I ran. Oh, I lost it somewhere here. Um, so. Uh, OC describe node, so I'm trying to get all the information about node, and I'm taking some selector, some label, where region is demo, this is the first line. And then I have a node, uh, and I can see somewhere here, uh, I have how many pods are on that particular node, what pods are there, and the, there are the, the limits of the, the quotas, but I don't have them enabled at all, so I don't see it here, but this is from this is the perspective of the uh, sysadmin user. So the simple command, I can see every single node and how many uh, pods are running on that particular node. Just a simple direct over uh, over the list of information. Yes. Sorry. I have a question related to CI. I mean, we have been <coughs> doing a lot of automation from the CI project within Red Hat. Of late, I mean, we started using Ansible. CI, you mean uh, continuous, continuous integration? Yeah. Like Jenkins? Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate that Michal went home because he was working, he's the engineer who actually built the Jenkins integration. Uh, it's not yet anywhere in the, in the project. Uh, it's in, I started something in the uh, in the origins, I think there are some. some uh, there's a plugin for Jenkins to be able to talk to OpenShift and Kubernetes. It's based on the Kubernetes plugin, but how it actually works, I'm not sure. I just know that you will you are able to use OpenShift to provision the build slaves for your builds. So you don't provision VMs, you provision the containers, and then you can collect all this information. You can also build all these. Uh, crazy workflows like if something builds and tests run, then you can do something or deploy something. But how it is implemented, it's not yet there, so I don't really know. But I'm interested to know uh, are there any docs, uh, any uh, editors for Ansible? Because when I write Ansible. For Ansible? Yeah. So uh, we mentioned it before, I think. Uh, there is the OpenShift Ansible project. So that's where all the uh, Ansible scripts live. This can provision your OpenShift, uh, and you choose if you want to use uh, just VMs, uh, if you want to use AWS or Google uh, Cloud Engine, and it can also provision the VMs on those cloud providers, or you can build your own deployment uh, when you specify, this is the IP address of my nodes, this is the IP address of my master, uh, ETCD should be there, etc. And then you run, Ansible, uh, run, uh, run the, the playbooks, and they do everything for you. So, uh, github.com slash openshift slash openshift dash answer. If you are interested in that, that's the best place. Uh, user management in openshift. It's not, not really easy. 
What? I don't really know. I never played with 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 the with the user management. Uh, did you try something like provision in your users? Uh, so I usually uh, there's an HT password file yes, on the yes. master. You can manually update that. But we also have support for integrating with a variety of identity management solutions. Uh, there's the Red Hat IDM. We have Active Directory integration. I think through IDM. Um, we can also integrate with uh, Keystone from OpenStack, and so that gives you a lot of options. Uh, but, um, the IDM integration, you can uh, you cannot uh, define groups of users like admins, viewers. It's uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much is encoded in the platform and how much is outsourced to the identity management solution itself, mm -hmm. but uh, we do support, support uh, role-based access control so you can have a, different, a, a team of people that are on the deploy team or the, you know, only the release team can push to production, okay. something like this. So uh, if you go to openchip.org, uh, you open the documentation part and you go to installation configuration, configuring authentication. There's identity providers and how to work with them. So essentially there are different ways how to do it and they have different paths and cons uh, based on what, what they do. As well as somebody was asking about the metrics, uh, there is enabling, enabling cluster metri metrics. So if you... And, looks, is the and there is a aggregating, aggregating container log. It? That's it. Okay. Yes, and you get routing from edge, uh, edge load balancers. That's like for switching the HA proxy for uh, F5 and etc. So all the different things that you need to configure, we have it described here in the documentation. Yes. Support for Kibana is already inside. Uh, from the administrative pr perspective, so if you're a admin, you can use Kibana to get the logs in the Elasticsearch. It's not integrated in the UI for the end users. Is there any limitation how many ports I can run on one node? Because I saw the 40, but I don't know how to, how to increase and work. work yeah, so there, there was a Kubernetes actually had it hard coded at one point that yeah. the limit was 40 per node. It was hard coded in yeah. there. And so I know um, I've done 100 per node. Um, it really depends on how much memory usage. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't recommend doing more than 100 per node. Uh, how do we if there's hard limit for it. Oh, uh, I think that was maybe four. eight months ago. I, I think we've made some changes uh -huh. and allowed yeah. it to be configurable now. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There has been some, some tests, like I think Samsung did some cluster with 1,000 or something on the right. node, so Kubernetes. And they are pushing oh. upstreaming the changes they did to make it happen yeah, with Kubernetes. From so. my experience and from what I've heard mm -hmm. from the operations team, they have said that Kubernetes can become somewhat unstable uh, at more than 100 per node. Um, okay. So it, it's probably a limitation in Kubernetes that I'm sure we have people working on to help. I think the yeah. limitation is on the Docker level that you need to uh, that pull might be. from Docker and Docker doesn't push the information. So you need to uh -huh. ask all the time to Docker a API to get all the information back. So if you have too many containers, there is too much information flowing down uh -huh. all the time. Okay. If there would be push interface from Docker, it, would, it should be, it's supposed to be a bit simpler, but they don't want to. So it's politics. Okay. You could pull, pull only one image at a time. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what the limitations are on the Docker engine. Only one. Okay. Yeah. You need to wait if you want to hmm. Yeah, I, I know that the Docker is a, a, a container spec that many people are very excited about. Um, I have also heard that um, Rocket uh, will allow better density and that there are tools available for translating. Um, I think there's something called Go ACI um, that will translate uh, using a somewhat open spec from Docker to Rocket. So theoretically, we could uh, allow you to ship a Docker image and then have us translate it on the fly into Rocket internally and get better density and perhaps a better uh, runtime engine. Um, so I know 
we're looking into that. I don't know uh, roadmap wise. So there will be a chance to run a rocket on uh, open chips in the it's, future? It's theoretically possible. Uh, I know we have a lot of R&D on a lot of different topics. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which ones of those topics actually get merged in. It requires testing and okay. you know a, a lot of evaluation. But we have been running with uh, 100 pods over here, and it was semi okay. So we had we had one of the nodes failing probably for some reason, but the other four nodes are just fine. Oh, it's possible that we have about 100 pods. Can you configure it for me? So you like you like to rewrite the code in the Kubernetes? I no no no. This is uh, configured from the Ansible script. Yeah. Uh, so this is something you can. Uh, uh, this is all generated from the Ansible script, um, and this probably is passed in to Kubernetes and using this variable where before it was uh, hard coded somewhere. So I think it's configurable now. Uh huh. Okay. Questions? I think we over we have overflown Over into time. the other session, right? The last one. Okay. So now is the free Q and A session. <laughs> <laughs> so please leave last questions. <laughs> yeah. You showed that uh, the port sees all the environments about uh, all the other containers on the files inside the project. Inside the project. Yes. So the project is a namespace. Let's say. Get the environment variables from the other, other container or the information about the other container? No, it's just the AP address, it's the port. It's, it's how to connect there, not the internal information of the container. But still, you, if, you, if you want to push some environment variable, you need to rest the container. There's uh, yeah. the, exactly since these images are meant to be uh, stateless, <coughs> so anytime you want to update the, the configuration, um, inside the container, we have a um, config change event that fires, which triggers a new deployment um, so in order to reprovision the image with new environment variables. These environment variables are pushed when you redeploy the application. So if you deploy a new service, you need to redeploy the application to consume it. It'll start a new deployment if you change the environment. Yes. No, no, you don't. It doesn't trigger the restart of the existing container. If you deploy a new service, you don't see the existing container. If you deploy a new service.